Hey everyone, welcome back to The Current. Uh, my name is Bo, I'm with Curtis. This is another episode of Real Talk on Real Topics. Exciting episode coming your way today. We are going to start a series on the Apostles' Creed. So this will be part one of that series. And I think what we'll do is we'll start off by, of course, talking about what the Apostles' Creed is. But then each Friday, we'll kind of just break it down and kind of line by line or thought by thought, kind of. Yeah, however we see fit. But this is, um, yeah, a really important creed that I think our church, even on our church website, you know, under the what we believe section, this is what we have. We have the Apostles' Creed. And so why don't you tell us a little bit, just kind of kick us off how we got it, what it is. Yeah, what is the Apostles' Creed? Um, It's a great question because for a lot of people, especially if you grew up, you know, maybe in a Catholic background or if you're someone that was, you know, Lutheran, Anglican, um, you probably have heard this creed each and every week you've been at church. And so um, a lot of times we know what it is, but where it came from is a different question. So, um really how we get the Apostles' Creed is it sort of began as a grassroots confession of faith. It was something that was used in early baptismal practices um, by the early church. So in the first couple centuries, um, we have documents that talk about some of the baptism practices of that early church, and so they would take them out into the water, and they would say, you know, do you believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? They say, yes, I do, and they dunk them, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, you know. So this confession was used as part of baptismal practice. Now, Mm. later on, some Christians give it the name the Apostles' Creed because there's sort of a a legend that goes along with it that, you know, each one of the 12 apostles wrote a line of this confession. Now, I don't necessarily think that's true. I don't think we'll Mm. ever totally know who wrote this document. But what we do know is that um, it functioned as a confession of faith, and it was circulating widely in the first couple centuries of the church. Um, so that's what it is, but I think it's also important for us to ask then, you know, why is this important? You said that it's it's on our um, church's belief page. Obviously, this is something important. Yeah. So why the Apostles' Creed? Um, help, you know, what's something that you think makes this document significant, or why should we pay attention to it? Well, I think it, like we've talked about several times on the podcast before, I like to get you know, as far back in history yeah. as possible. And I think a document or a creed like this just withstands time. And there's just a lot of tradition. And we can look back in time with, you know, Christians from hundreds and hundreds of years ago that are making these same professions of faith. And um, I think there's something beautiful about that. Just the history of it, I think, yeah. is why it's important. And then also, I think... Um, having unity in like the essentials. Mm. I think a lot of times like Christianity can become so, you know, nitpicky on certain beliefs and ideas. And I say like, I think there's just something beautiful about having a, a document or a creed to say, this is kind of stuff we'll fight over, but you know, everything else kind of hold with an open hand and, um, you know, within, Christianity as a whole, if we can just, you know, agree to these things, we're good. You know, I, I like that too. It's it's very kind of defining of what just the, the basic, just fundamental Christian beliefs are. Yeah, it was yeah. so helpful. I love, like you said, we, we want to go back and say, what was the earliest Christians kind of thinking? What was their thought process? And so we have, yeah, just solidified for us this confession of faith that's, you know, in the earliest forms of Christianity. But I think you're so right that it also helps us sort of establish some guidelines or some parameters, if you will, um, to say, okay, what, what are what is it at its base that we as Christians are confessing to believe in? Mm-hmm. And so I think this is helpful. It almost gives us sort of a, you know, like a mere Christianity. And I don't know about you, we both kind of grew up in some more Baptist backgrounds. So I'm guessing this wasn't something you ever heard or spoke on Sundays no, or anything like that. No, no. Yeah, I honestly didn't even know what it was until a few years ago. I never heard it, you know, until I think I got on the Rhythm Church website, maybe when I was applying for <laughs> yeah. the job here. I mean, I honestly had never run across it. I mean, yeah, growing up Southern Baptist, they adhere to the Baptist faith and message. Mm-hmm. That's kind of their statement of faith. And so, of course, when I was in school and, you know, in Bible college and stuff, that's the document or that's the the book. It's really a book. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's you know, <laughs> um, that was the 
you know, standard for, for yeah. beliefs in the, the Baptist life. And so, um, what's funny is even this week we talked about how I disagree with the very first sentence of the Baptist vision yeah. message, but hopefully um, do you disagree with the another. first line of the apostles creed? No. Okay. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, that's maybe for a topic some other day, but yeah. anyway, um, yeah, no, I didn't never heard of it, you know, until yeah. It wasn't something for me life, either yeah. because, you know, if you're part of a church that kind of, um, you know, it tends to be you have a couple of voices of authority for churches and it tends to be scripture and it tends to be Christian tradition. And so there's different levels of, um, you know, depending on the denomination or the faith background, you're going to get more or less a mix of certain things. And so, you know, it's like Catholic, very high in the church tradition. This is a big, important document for them alongside some other stuff. And the Bible's important, too. Um, and on the other end, like the Baptist, we get where it's all about the Bible. Church tradition doesn't really get brought up too much. So yep. there's no space really for the creed. But, you know, like I said, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Anglicans, all these people, people who look to the Bible's authority, also say, hey, the tradition of the church, what it's always taught, has some weight, some sure. pull here as well. Um and so, yeah, I, I'm excited just to, for our church to say, hey, how can we bring this confession of faith? How can we bring the creed to bear in sort of a, you know, a non-denominational context? So yeah, I think it's a cool thing. Yeah. And I mean, even like there's some, I don't know, practical points to this as well. You know, if I were to be asked or to, if I was to ask someone else, you know, would you be able to articulate the gospel to mm. me? You know, again, you brought up scripture and like, you know, but I also think there's something to be said. To, yeah. Okay. So however you answer that question, can that be found in the past? Yeah. You know, did people in the past communicate the gospel the same way? The writers of scripture, did they communicate? You know, you look in the book of Acts was what was being preached. You know, so I think there's a lot to that. And, and I think the importance of, I think just think that's one argument for the importance of, mm. you know, church tradition is because yeah. I think just even answering that simple question of what is the gospel for me, that has changed over the years because I grew up with this idea of what the gospel is that mm -hmm. isn't really found in church history. It wasn't yeah. really, you know, it, it's become something modern and it's become something, you know, that maybe isn't all the way. Oh, yeah, and I think the creed just acts, and, and yeah. church tradition acts, is a good just sort of checks and balances. You know, you put a Bible in someone's hand, uh, and, you know, in 10 different people's hands, you can arrive with 10 different things pretty quick. Yeah. And so the creed sort of gives us some some um, boundaries, but there's a surprising amount of flexibility within the creed, which I like. So here, here's some boundaries. Here, as interpreters of Scripture, this keeps us on the right path. Um, and, and that's even how ancient Christians used. They had a confession of faith, a rule of faith. Here's some, sort of the church's teaching and let me make sure that that's in dialogue with my reading of scripture. So I think here at Rhythm, we're, we're keeping with, you know, centuries of church tradition and saying, hey, how can we faithfully listen to scripture, but how can we allow just the church's tradition to inform, not dictate, but to inform that, yeah. um, you know, and have a healthy balance. Yeah. And here at Rhythm, obviously we're non-denominational. So many of you, you might be listening and you attend a church that, you know, is a part of a particular denomination. Um, obviously, we have a little bit more freedom, mm. but that's kind of what a creed does, is hopefully I think all Christians across the board would be able to, you know, agree. But some of the, you know, some of those other areas, you might not have, the, you know, the luxury or, or you, you may not, you might think kind of your denomination, hey, this is what we take and this is kind of how we see it. But again, like my hope is that I get something like the Apostles' Creed is, kind of a unifying thing whereas i mean yeah. not a nominational church we don't have any of the the pressures to hold to certain ideas and so no. i love kind of the flexibility and freedom so um let's jump yeah. into the first line if you want to yeah say what that is and then we'll talk about that for just a little bit here and then we'll wrap up that'd be good so the first line of the creed we're going to look at is um i believe in god the father almighty the maker of heaven and earth so right off the bat any sort of you know theological I feel like there's text. a lot here are there we gonna have time to well, we'll just we'll we'll do we'll do what we can. We'll make it. I think there's a can. lot here. There is a lot. There's a lot. We in better that. jump in. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. All right, God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. Um, I think a great place to start is obviously the creed begins by you know making known a God. I believe in God. Obviously, this sure. is a religious document. It makes sense. Um, but what I love is at the beginning it says I believe in God, not just 
a random God, but God the Father mm-hmm. Almighty, we'll talk about that. So I think a great place to start just in this creed is right away it brings in this sort of Trinitarian yeah. language, right? Which is yeah. definitely something that's unique at the heart of the Christian faith. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's not any other Trinitarian religions out there. So nope. uh, I think it's important for us to say, okay, right at the be- right at the base, to talk about God the Father implies a God the Son, implies mm-hmm. some sort of a trinity. So um, maybe just take a couple minutes here— what do you think is important about this or, you know, why, why the Trinity? What's, what's uh, a small question. I know. <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, I think the Trinity, like you just said, is kind <laughs> of the crux really of the Christian faith because it makes it so unique, mm. but it's also, um, you know, with the Bible being such a foundational piece of our faith and kind of, you know, the framework, um, Obviously, having God represented in three forms is evident throughout the scriptures. But, I mean, you think about God the Father, Jesus the Son, and then the Holy Spirit. Um, there's just so much of Christian Christianity and the Christian life that mm. deals with all three. <laughs> and the three forms, I guess, of God. And I don't know. I just I just think that's such a such a big piece of, of what Christianity is. And, and I don't think it's something that... Uh, it'd be tough to. I know there's. Make, I know people can make arguments against it, but yeah, it's it's just tough. I, At the very I think least, it's tough. Yeah. before I even get you know bogged down in arguments about the Trinity, I like to say again, what? Let's look at the early Christians. The yeah. Church has spoken univocally throughout yeah. its existence that God is someone who exists in three persons. It's Trinity in unity, unity in Trinity, and yeah. so I think. One of the things I want to highlight when we're talking about Trinity, you know, the, the creed wants to say, hey, this God exists as more than just one person. Um, one of the unique advantages, I think, as being a Christian and and believing in a God who is triune is a couple of things. One is I think it allows us to really say that God is love. Um, mm, yeah, you know, point. God exists from eternity past as a community of mm. self-giving individuals towards one another. Like at the core you know, it's tough to say what what is this Trinity. It's a, it's kind of yeah. beyond our language, but at the core of who God is is self giving relational love. Mm. And so we just have as Christians a better, I think, inside track to be able to say, um, no, God isn't loving; He is, yeah, love for sure. That's so good. And then it gets to I mean, if you keep going, it gets to this idea of creation and the importance of mm. God being the creator. Um, I know sometimes you can get bogged down in the creation account and there's a lot of, you know, varying thoughts and ideas on how that came to be. Um, but I just want to hear kind of your perspective. What, what, what is the importance of proclaiming that God is the one that created? Yeah. What do you think is on the line there? Like the. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, I think you're so right to say, hey, sometimes we get bogged down on some other things. You know, the, the creed confesses that, you know, it's God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, that God is the, the creator of all that is. And it really just kind of leaves it there. And I think that's so, you know, I, I don't think the people that wrote the creed at this time would have even had a idea of evolution, creationism, sure. or young earth, old earth. I think yeah. they would have been like, what are you talking about? Um, <laughs> but I think there's some advantage here that we as Christians don't need to be beating each other up over what it looks like for God to be creator or how it all kind of came out, young earth, old earth, theistic evolution, you know, all, all those kind of things. Um, but what is important is that we have a God who is the creator and sustainer of all things. And so, um, yeah, I think this is important because when we're talking as Christians, we're dealing with a God who is almighty, has all the power who is the creator of all things. He's not, you know, um, dependent on anything. He existed independent of all that was. He is sustained, fulfilled in and of himself. He lacks nothing. There's no, um, you know, latent potential needing to be activated in God. And so I think it's the creed trying to say, look, we're not dealing with, um, a God who is kind of in the midst of this kind of stuff. No, we're dealing with the creator God, one Mm. who is outside of, independent of any sort of creation and is the one who is the source um, of all that we see around us. So it's not some sort of pantheism where God and nature are one and it's all here. No, 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 no. We have um, uh, an intelligent mind that sits outside of this created order. And I think that's what's important for us to get. Yeah. And obviously creation 
not only of all that, I mean, there was nothing and then there was something mm. like that, you know, signifies the power of God, but also from just an extended view is the creation of us as people. Sure. And, you know, like that too is important that he, you know, like just breed life into humans and they're created in his image. I think there's a lot there too, is we can't just say he's the creator, but I mean, that creation involves us, it involves us as people and how, you know, and I would make an argument to say that, you know, humanity is different than the rest of creation or other animals. Yeah, and anyway, so unique. yeah, it's a whole nother topic we can maybe discuss sometime, but, um, yeah, there's a lot there. And, and I'm, I'm so glad you brought up the point of, of talking about, kind of God standing outside of this, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, and it would be tough to worship a, a God that, you know, is subject to other power. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know, God like, is not one amidst some equals. Yeah. We don't have a pantheon of gods and we yeah. don't have a God who again, yeah, is connected to, and, and I think this is what makes God in some ways beautiful. He, I mean, he's truly free, truly. Mm. In a, he lacks nothing totally sustained in and of himself, not, contingent on anything not tied to creation and yet out of that freedom he chooses to create chooses to give um and i think that's a beautiful thing too Um, god is not compelled to it's it's grace you know Um, it's out of the abundance and overflow of who he is that he decides to create not because if he has any need you know and another beautiful thing he loves us this gets into that not because he needs us um no his love is is free it's secure he's enough in his in and of himself but um chooses to bestow that on us. So I think another just beautiful kind of image there and understanding God to be other than outside of, to be creator. For sure. Yeah. And obviously we're getting at big ideas here, a God just being as creator. But I would challenge you if you're listening and you're somebody that tends to fight over the creation account or mm. fight over specific ways it happened, young earth, old earth stuff. I mean, I know we've had in the past people leave our church because of mm. an opinion of one of our pastors on right. old earth, young earth. And it's like... Yeah. I would just encourage you to see a broader picture. And again, mm-hmm. that's what kind of this, hopefully this podcast series will do is, you know, just we're walking through this, just kind of, this is the parameters of Christianity. And is it really worth fighting over something like that? You know, if yeah. we can all disagree that God created, why do all the details necessarily matter? I mean, I get it's important to think about it. I'm not saying, you, yeah. just, you know, not think about it, but is it worth fighting over? I guess yep. is a better, better thing. And so I would just encourage you if you're listening and, you tend to fight over things like that. Just maybe ease up a little and yeah. just try to, you know, really, I mean, there are guardrails in place and there are Bible believing, God loving, amazing Christian people on both sides of the argument and yep. really smart, intelligent people yep. on both sides of those kind of arguments. Um, so not someone not agreeing with your take on the specific creation account does not make them not Christian. Um, yeah. I, I just kind of wanted to say that because I feel like that's going to come up throughout all of this series as we walk through some of these things. Um, you know, as we get to, you know, some of the other stuff too, it's like, I think that's you know. so, so good. <laughs> I, you know, because oftentimes this was my experience kind of growing up in the Christian church. And then as I went off to Bible college, and wanted to start, you know, thinking about being a pastor and thinking about these theological things. I felt like I always heard the term like heretic thrown around Mm. and talking about people who like, oh, disagree, like, oh my gosh, that heretic thinks, you know, insert whatever here. And what I found was like, okay, what, what makes someone a heretic and not like, where's this line? And what I found is that oftentimes this is drawn way too narrow of a circle. You know, if you don't look exactly like a, you know, fundamentalist Protestant (laughs) Christian, you're not a Christian, you're a heretic. And what I love about the creed is it, it kind of checks us a little bit. And as much as sometimes I want to say, this is how you should think, this is the more right answer, the creed forces me to step back and say, nope, there's room for these people at the Christian table. I might disagree with exactly how they break it down, but I don't get to, you know, when we say heresy, that's an intense thing. Like, we're, we're making yeah. division now. Uh, yeah, you, this is not something that can be a part of our group. And so um, I love the creed because it, it causes us to say, no, there's some freedom, there's some flexibility yep. here. Young earth, old earth. Um what you take on the spiritual gifts are how do you feel about baptism of infants well i'll tell you what the creed allows room for all of these people to sit at the table to be in dialogue and say okay we're getting what is essential correct yeah yeah and there yeah there's something beautiful about unity 
you mm-hmm. know, and, and understanding that as Christians, we can have varying opinions on some of the specific things, but no matter what, like Jesus is King, he's Lord of all and in God's fact, the creator. We're going to get to that in the very next <laughs> one. That's the very yeah. next line. So yeah, for sure. So, um, I love it. Anything else you want to add about the first line of, of this? No, just to say, again, I'm excited to, to keep going through this creed and, um, I don't know, to see there are some things in here that we're going to say, oh, yeah, duh, of course it should be in here. And I'm excited because there's some things in the creed that I think are going to challenge us and, and, and push a little bit. So I'm just looking forward to the weeks to come. Sure. Well, thanks for joining with us on The Current. I know that um, it's a sacrifice to take time to listen to us uh, just ramble on sometimes <laughs> about things. But we appreciate you and, and know that, that uh, yeah, and we're always open to feedback and dialogue again. Mm-hmm. So be sure and um, share the podcast with a friend. Um, we're always trying to expand our reach. And so if you've enjoyed just listening to our podcast, we'd love it if you'd share it with somebody that you know. And um, it's it's always fun. And so, yeah, we'll be back next week. We'll continue going through uh, the Apostles' Creed. We'll see you then. Grace and peace. Mm-hmm.